Thank you, Brother Shakarian, and good morning, friends. Certainly good to be here in Los Angeles again this morning, prior to this great convention and the oncoming meeting of this coming week over at the Embassy Hotel. I'm expecting to see you all over there, and we're all under a great expectation to meet our Lord Jesus and see him over there. He promised that he would be wherever two or three was gathered together, he would be there. And I'm sure that I met him this morning as I come up the steps here in this auditorium when all the people with great anticipations waiting for the breakfast and the speaking. And it's good to be gathered here with you. And uh, to the radio audience, there's so many in here. There, I had to go down on the next floor and speak to a few and seen so many requests heart trouble and different ailments of their bodies, and we're here now to pray for the sick and the afflicted. Just as I got top the steps, I'm looking at the old gentleman now, he came up to me and said, Brother Branham, years ago, he said he had heart trouble so bad that he, he thought he was going to die, and had prayer for him, and the grace of God healed him, and here he is this morning, way in his 80s, just rejoicing. So... That makes us take new hope. And now I'm certainly soliciting the prayers of the people out in the uh, radio land as well as here. After I leave this meeting, I'm going to Europe, down into Africa and around all meetings. And uh, this is going by a vision, so it's going to be a great meeting there, I'm sure. And I felt for years that the Lord has wanted me to come back, the little humbly, humble ministry that he gave me. I don't think he's quite finished with it yet over there. It seemed like there might be a soul somewhere that I could catch in the gospel net, the one that he's given me to sing for the people, a way of divine healing, praying for the sick. And I certainly solicit your prayers, both you people here and them or out in the radio audience. I don't have time to take a text and preach, which I'm expecting to after a few minutes here in the... In the, this auditorium, but just to speak and to, to you a few moments to get acquainted and to the people out in the land, I'm going to have prayer for those out there right away, and you here also. And I'm certainly glad to meet all these fine new friends that I, I've never met before, just come in contact with them this morning. We've been having great times uh, in the services and other places. I don't get out too much anymore. It's so busy. We just try to keep the road hot between Jeffersonville, Indiana, and Tucson, Arizona, where we moved out there a few years ago by a vision of the Lord that sent us out there to not knowing where I was going. And many of you here at Clifton's, I spoke to you a little before I left in a Phoenix meeting of a vision that had come of seeing seven angels in a cluster. Now, I know to the radio audience, perhaps many of you are not full gospel, and this may seem a little mysterious to you, which it would to me. But there is anyone who can explain anything. You don't have to accept it anymore by faith. It's things that we cannot explain that we have to accept by faith. We cannot explain God. No man can explain God. He's sovereign. He's great and mighty. We just... We just accept it because we know he's there. And then by our faith in accepting it, he brings the response back to us as the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which I'm just going to speak to you about in a few moments here, on God's way, our place of worship. And the only place that you can worship him, the only place he'll ever meet you, he's got he's one church, one place, one time, one people, and all that God meets. And it's, I hope that the Lord blesses the message to your heart here. Now, coming to Tucson, it was strange. Those visions speaking to you in the name of the Lord, not one of them as I ever can recall, and will ask anyone else if they can recall any time that he ever did say anything but what was the truth. It always happens just the way he says it will happen. And he's supposed to, according to the Scriptures, return to us in this last days and this type of ministry. That'll be after the baptism of the Spirit and speaking in tongues and divine healing and so forth, these things, the capping of the Pentecostal message 
It's what we're speaking of today, this ministry of the Christ himself impersonated among his people with the very same things that he did when he was here on earth in his body, the bride, which is part of him, doing the same things as husband and wife or king and queen just before the marriage ceremony. This week, the Lord willing, I wish to speak some on that out in the, our campaign here at the, the Embassy Hotel and kind of get acquainted in my humble way of doing it, the, the time and the hour that we're living, if a person don't know which way to go or what to do or how to turn, you're not walking by faith anymore. You're just guessing. You're presuming. And presume is to, to advance without official authority. So if we haven't got the real official authority to know what God said would take place in this hour, how are we ever going to face this hour? And we've got to face it knowing by faith in his word the things that are supposed to be happening now and the condition of the nations, the condition of the people, condition of the church, and so forth. We've got to know that and then how to walk out to face it. If you don't know how to do that, you're just just what we used to call kind of haphazardly, just jumping, hoping it'll be here, hoping this and hoping that, and will it be, but God don't want us to do that. He wants us to know what he has said about this day, and then meet it by faith because he said it would be that way. And we, we know your truth then because you haven't got some person's word for it, you got his word of what we must do. And we're hoping that our Heavenly Father will, will grant this to us this week. Now I'm sorry that I cut off of what I was saying a few moments ago about coming to Tucson. And I thought myself that it was the end of my life. I thought no one could ever stand that shock of that condition that happened in that vision that morning about 10 o'clock at home that would ever be able to live after that. Well, I come to Tucson making arrangements with uh, my son for my wife and and children to go with him after I was gone because I thought it was my end. And I, and Phoenix, the man in the meetings before it happened, I told you just how it would happen. Well, a few months after that, I was up in Sabina Canyon one morning, which is just north of Tucson. I was up there to pray. And while I was praying, I had my hand up in the air and saying, Father, I pray thee that thou will and somehow help me and give me strength for the hour that I'm now facing. And if my work is finished here on earth, then I must come to you. And it's not as I regret coming, but I know that you'll take care of my family. And I, I'm just asking for strength for this hour. And something struck my hand. Now, radio audience, this may seem strange, as I have said, but it's the truth, and God is my judge. I looked at my hand, and there was a sword. Uh, had a sheath over the handle part, and the handle itself was made of pearl. This looked like kind of a gold-like guard over the handle part, and the, the knife itself looked rather like it was kind of a shiny, like, oh, something like chrome or something glistening in the sun. Now it's about 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning, way on top of a mountain. You can imagine how a person, uh, feel that I'm in my right mind, would feel standing there with a sword from nowhere, people for miles and miles holding that in your hand. I felt of it, tucked them, waved the blade back and forth, and why it was a sword. And I looked around and I said, well, now, how could that ever happen? Here I am standing here, right here, and no one around for miles and miles, and where did that come from? And I said, well, I, I suppose maybe it's the Lord telling me it's my end time. And a voice spoke and said, this is the sword of the Lord. And I thought, well, a sword... Then it's to, for like a king tonight, you know, how they used to do in England and different places. I thought, that's what that is for, tonight. And uh, I thought, well, maybe I'm supposed to lay hands on people. <laughs> I had all kinds of human mind can be all messed up. You know, you don't know. Our minds is finite. His is infinite. So, and as I was, it, then it left my hand and I didn't know where it went. It just disappeared. Well, if a person didn't understand a little bit about spiritual things, you'd, you'd go crazy like that. You'd be standing there and wonder what happened. And he said, 
The vision is not your end time, it's for your ministry. That sword is the word. The seven seals will be opened, the mysteries of... And then two weeks after that, or two months rather after that, I was up in the mountain with a bunch of friends when it happened. Seven angels, just as clear as you're standing here, came sweeping down from heaven. The rocks and the mountains rolled out and down the hills, and, and people stand there were screaming and going on and on, dust flying everywhere. And when it was, he said, return to your home now. Will be Each angel will be one of the seals, of the seven seals, which is on tape, and the book will be out pretty soon, being now it's kind of grammarized. As you know, my grammar is not very good, and people wouldn't. You just have to be people that love me and know how to understand me on my grammar, but uh, some theologian is grammarizing it for me and um, taking out all the, the uh, well, maybe I said the wrong word there. I don't even know. So I heard someone laughing, so I guess that grammarized wasn't right. But um, like the Dutchman, you take me for what I mean and not what I say. Maybe. And it's uh, just uh, three minutes now, I'm told, until the... Uh, closing of the program. Now you dear people out in radio land, and you that's sick and needy here in the audience, would you just lay your hands on each other now while we have this word of prayer for the sick. Now Jesus said his last commission to the church, these signs shall follow them that believe. Them. Them that believe. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. Dear Heavenly Father, we're like children today, we're obeying what you said do. We are laying hands upon all these telephone requests. Thou seest them out in the land, out there, how they're needy, the suffering. You see those here that are needy, suffering. And we are committing them to thee, dear God, with this faith in thy word, that thou hast said, these signs shall follow them that believe. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. Grant it, Lord, in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Brother Shakarin. It's a, certainly a grand privilege to be back again on the broadcast to speak to some of our friends out in the radio land, as well as present here. And we're certainly extending this invitation to you to come to the Embassy Hotel tomorrow afternoon to be prayed for, and not only that, but to bring the ones that sinners and those who are backslidden. If we just have uh, a prayer for the sick, and we do see God constantly doing great miracles, but that's secondarily. The main thing is to be saved. Fill with God's Spirit, which I'm going to speak to you about just in a few moments here. And the sufficiency, how that we must be filled with God's Spirit. And divine healing usually draws an attention to people to, and brings them in the presence of God. When God does something is, that they know is un... Well, it's not understood. We cannot mechanically show how it's done. God does it in His own great way then that attracts the attention of the people to know that there's a presence of a power somewhere that can do something that's beyond human understanding. And that causes them to look to the Lamb of God. And always divine healing, I've been told and I believe myself that about between 60, maybe 70 percent of our Lord's ministry was on divine healing. And he did that to attract the people. Then when they were there, he said, except you believe I am he, you will perish in your sins. Now, divine healing is a great drawing card to get people to look to the Lord Jesus. And Dr. F.F. F. Bosworth, which many of you are, was a friend to and knew him, and his ministry meant so much to me as a young minister, I uh, started out in my meetings and I run into Brother Bosworth. He used to say divine healing... It's a crude little statement now. He said, divine healing is the bait on a fish hook. He said, you never show the fish the hook, you show him the bait. And then he gets at the bait and gets on the hook. So that's what we try to do. That's our, uh, we are 
aim is to get people to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if he was a healer in the days gone by, he's a healer today. Uh, just a personal testimony before I pray for the sick out in the radio land. It was um, a few days ago I was sitting up in a mountains where a great thing had taken place before uh, 15 or 20 brethren there where the angel of the Lord came so down and great light flying like a comet bursting around through the mountains and rocks flying for 200 feet or more across there cutting the top of the trees out. And I was standing right under it and told him just a few months before it happened, it would be there. And what would happen? Frankly, it was told the day before. And all these men running under trucks and everything trying to get away, they didn't know what had taken place. And he spoke and said what would take place right immediately afterwards. Sitting on this certain rock there right where he had uh, appeared, I had a, a friend that was with us that had come down from up in Minnesota his people are here this morning, and I'm not sure but what he may be here on some of the other floors. It was Donovan Wirtz, and a fine young fellow, a Lutheran, that had just given his life to Christ and been filled with the Spirit. Very humble German boy, about 30 years old, family, two or three little children. He moved down to Tucson just to be neighbors with me, where three or four hundred had moved in to be neighbors. So he... I'm glad to have such neighbors as that. They follow me always in South Africa and everywhere around just to be near, to see the with me and to be with me and enjoy the pleasures of the Lord. Such a humble fellow. I never noticed him very much. Of course, the people that I know and associate with are just like my own brother, sister. I watch them and see if I think they're getting out of line and take them out to one side and talk with them because I love them. We want to live in glory together. And sometimes maybe in the meetings you think I speak harsh to you. That isn't from that isn't because that I don't love you. But it does come from my heart because uh, I, it must be just one way. There's only one way to serve God and, I, and we must stay in His way no matter what our thoughts is. His way. And I noticed Donovan on the right tip of his ear was swollen perhaps three times its size and looked very red. Well, not thinking maybe that there in the desert uh, for a few days that where we've been, that maybe he had gotten some cactus in his ear. But uh, taking a hold of his hand, I found out it was a cancer. So I said to Donovan, I said, Donovan, uh, have you, how long has that been on your ear? Just uh, kind of throw him off like I didn't know. I said, uh, how long has that been on there, Donovan? He said, Brother Branham, about six months. He said, I said, why didn't you mention it to me? He said, oh, seeing so busy. He said, I didn't want to, to do it. He said, I just thought maybe sometime the Lord might tell you. <laughs> so uh, I said, do you realize what it is? He said, I have a good idea. I said, that is right. And the second morning, no more than that, holding the boy by the hand, the second morning there wasn't even a scar on his ear. Glory uh, it was all completely gone. Glory. So many times we press and, and trying to get to this, that, or see, it's the, these signs shall follow the believer. It didn't say if they pray for the sick, if they lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. We must have faith ourselves in what we're doing. All right. So now, Donovan is probably here. You'll meet him. He'll be here. If he isn't here this morning on some of the other floors, you'll meet him. And, He'll know the testimony. And what more could I say? I believe Luke or John once said, uh, the world couldn't can hold, contain the books that could be written of what he's done among the people in this last days. How six been healed, alcoholics delivered by the thousands of them, and all kinds of diseases and afflictions. Now, you out in Radio Land, as well as here, I'm holding here now a great handful of requests that's come in by the phone this morning, constantly ringing since we've been here. And uh, so we, uh, 196 requests has come in this morning by the phone since we've been in here. So let us join in prayer now as each one, wherever you are, out in the land, lay your hands on one another if you're believers. If not, lay your hand up on the Bible or something out there while we pray here and there.
Dear Heavenly Father, the little testimony of Donovan works. Just one of the thousands, Lord, that thou hast so graciously, I pray that you'll look down into the hearts of the people, both here and in radio land, and may the everyone be healed. May the evil one leave them, and may they be delivered from all their afflictions. Grant it, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, thy Son, we ask it. Amen. This is three times for me up here this morning. Right. And you know, it was just told that we got to vacate the building in about 12, 14 minutes or something. And um, the management said it's on the other floor there and they can't serve any meals. <laughs> Our meals lengthened out. We have many courses, you know. <laughs> so we're very, very glad that we have had this great uh, spiritual gastronomical jubilee, you know, I would call it, this morning, here with this fine bunch of man. I'd like to, to make mention that we are, the services again tomorrow afternoon over at the embassy now, we will be praying for the sick there and expecting God to meet with us. And I've come to put in my part, my ministry, into making all that we can this meeting to be a success. Not a success because it's our meeting, but a success of people finding Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the success. Any meetings, no matter how much we praise God, or how many great things that we see Him do, how many times He speaks to us in the Spirit, and so forth, unless there's something accomplished, some souls brought into the kingdom. And uh, Brother Shakari and I we just made a, a real statement just now about what he thought about these days that we're, we're living in. I truly believe that with all my heart, that we're living just at the closing time, just in, a, just in the evening shadows. The sun is far advanced. And when we see things taking place the way they are today, why, it's hard telling what another generation would bring. A few days ago, just let me give you a little inside something. Uh, they made an analysis throughout Arizona, where I live, of all the schools that gave the children unknowingly to them a mental test. And guess what? Including high schools and, and uh, grammar school, there was 80% of the children suffering with mental deficiency. 70% of them was television watchers. The, the evil they just slipped up on us and we don't... You wonder why it comes. You can hear the voice of God screaming out against it and yet here we, we find ourselves webbed into it. Let me give you a, a shocking something. See, not all that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter in, but the one that doeth the will of my Father. His will is his word. We can be ever so religious, have great time shouting, jumping in these meetings, which we're... I don't, I don't want to be critical, but I have a, a duty to do to God. And that duty is to be sincere and to say what he wants me to say. And I'm, I'm certainly grateful for the California chapter who's bore with me and, and my convictions. If I don't speak my convictions, I'm a hypocrite. I'm not, I'm not even honest with you. And if I can't be honest with you, how will I be honest with God? Because I see you and talk to you. Of course, we do to God too, but we got to be really sincere and honest with one another. We are certainly in a... a horrible horrible age and did you ever stop just let me give you a, just a little analysis not all that saith unto me lord lord will enter therein but the one that doeth the will of my father jesus said on earth man shall not live by bread alone but by every word every word not just at now and then a word but by every word it was one word Misbelieved by God of God's commandments that cause death, sorrow, and ever sickness and heartache. To miss God's word, one word, if He taken the human race into death by mis misbelieving one word, surely, surely. But He said it would happen. Satan said, surely it won't, but it did. So we've got to keep every word of God. And if the human and all this suffering and things that went on the human race by 
misconstruing or, or misbelieving one word, how are we going back by missing one? If it's cost all this price, even the life of his son. Many are called, few are chosen. Many are called, few are chosen. I can't take a text from this but because we haven't got time, but just to leave something with you. Let us think of, I went one day with Brother Shakari and you know, one of his high breeding cattle, and I seen the, the, in the laboratory where Brother Shakari had taken me in, and they I dipped uh, in the spurn of, uh, of the male cow uh, just a, a little, like a little instrument of match stem, and took up a bunch of that spurn and put it under this glass that magnified it hundreds of times. And there was little germs jumping in that, in that sperm, which we know the germ comes from the male and the egg from the female. And I asked the chemist there, I said, uh, what's that making that little jump like that? He said, that's, uh, that's little bulls and calves. See? And I said, in that little drop? He said, yes. I said, perhaps then in the entire sperm there would be a million of them. He said, oh, yeah. See? Now watch close. Now, when this great thing takes place, there's one egg waiting for one germ out of that million. And there's no one can tell which germ that is or which egg that is. If you'd watch the natural birth, it's more of a mystery than the, than the virgin birth. Because in the sperm, there's one in there that's predestinated to live, and the rest of them will die. And it isn't the first one meets, it's the first one that comes together with the egg. Maybe the egg may raise up from the back of the sperm or the middle of the sperm, the germ may do the same. The, egg, the germ crawls into the egg and little tails drop off of it and there starts the spine. There's only one and that whole load of a million that's going to make it. Only one. And that's determined by some unknown force to man. That you're every one alike. Every one of those germs are just alike. Same thing in animals, same thing in man. It's determined where it's going to be boy, girl, red-headed, black-headed, or what. It's determined by God. All of them look the same naturally, but there's one in there that's ordained to life. One in a million. Yet all of them alike. When Israel left Egypt, there was approximately two million people left at the same time. Every one of them heard the message of a prophet. Every one of them saw the pillar of fire. Every one of them was baptized to Moses in the Red Sea. Every one of them shouted in the, in the Spirit, beat the tambourines and run up and down the bank with Miriam when Moses sang in the Spirit. They everyone drink from the same spiritual rock. They everyone eat fresh manna every night. Amen. Every one of them. But there was two made the land. One out of a million. Glory to God. What was the test? They all drink in the same rock. They all eat the same spiritual manna as we're eating this morning. But the word test proved it. When it come to the time of Kadesh Barnea, when they started over into the promised land, and they could not go over until they was tested by the word. And all the, the other ten came back and said, we can't make it. The people are like, uh, we're like grasshoppers to them. They're great walled cities. The opposition is too great. But Joshua and Caleb still the people. They said, we're more than able to do it. Why? God said before they left the promised land, I've given you the land. I've given it to you. It's yours. But there were one out of each million. There's approximately 500 million so-called Christians in the world today. And each day ends a generation. And now what if the rapture would come today and 500 people universally would be taken in the rapture You'd never know or even see in the paper them going. 
And the coming of the Lord is a secret coming. He'll come and steal it away. He'll be such a minority. So just like it was in the days when the disciples asked Jesus, why does the scribe say that, that Elias must first come? He said, he's already come. Amen. And you never knew it. Amen. Did you ever think what the people did? They went right on believing that, Mal- that um, Elias was coming. And he was right among them. Amen. And they didn't know it. So will it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Amen. He'll do with him just the same thing. The Spirit of God is here. Well, what are we going to do with it? Are we going to eat manna and so forth and not continually move up as we grow? Did you ever notice a seed, as the Reverend Pitts was speaking a few moments ago, and how a seed goes into the ground? Many seeds are there in the ground. When God moved up on the water with the light, and light brought forth the first uh, presence of God, L- spoken light came by God's Word. And God's Word is the only thing that still brings light. And when the waters went back, the seed is already in the earth. And the light only brought forth the seeds that remain with germ in them. Come forth. God make it His creation. And now on Easter morning, there was another light struck the earth when the Holy Spirit was given. And it's given to bring life to those seeds that God, by His foreknowledge, knew that would be here on the earth. As He knew the first natural seed, He knows where the spiritual seed is. Your body was laying here right down on the earth. When God first brought the earth into existence, we are part of the earth. We were laying there. And by His foreknowledge, He knew exactly who would love him and who would serve him and who would not. His foreknowledge tells that. If it doesn't, then he isn't God. He can't be God without being infinite. And if he's infinite, he knows all things. So you see people making their blunders. They stumble at it. They run at it. They think this and that. But it doesn't work right. We see it. But there is a working right. That's to find God's perfect will and stand in it. What God calls you for. As Brother Jack said a few moments ago, about down here at the, the Persian Square, all the confusion, one this way and one that way, and about the theologians and so forth that you want to know some theology, go down there. I guess that's just about like it is in Hyde Park in London. I was down there. Everybody has his own idea. It's a, it's a conglomeration of of a modern-day world in Babylon. But did you notice, as, as Brother Pitts went on with his lovely message this morning to us, as he began to walk out of the park, there he found a little Easter lily. In the midst of all the confusion... As he brought it to us, it had no way to say yes or no. It was the life of God shining in it in the midst of all the confusion. It was there in its radiance because God had ordained it to be there. In the midst of all the conflict, no one was noticing it. They didn't see the spiritual application of it. And so is it today amongst all of our great gatherings and groups and churches and denominations and so forth. One pulling this way, we must be Baptist, we must be Presbyterian, we must be this, that, or the other. In the midst of all of it, there is a growing power. There is a power of God right among us, being raised right up in the midst of all of us. Let's just stop and behold it a few minutes and watch it this week and see it unfold right before us. We believe God will do it, don't you? I see it. We ought to be downstairs by now. So let's pray, each one of us. Dear God, when we bow our heads in thy presence, we are feel that we are so insufficient to ask. But 
you promised us that if we would come, you would not turn us down. And these rude statements that's just been made by no means to be a doctrine, one out of a million, but just to kind of remember. Or you said, straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there will be that will find it. For many are called, but few are chosen. O eternal Father, send the gospel light across this city through this coming week of convention, and if there be any seed, somehow by your own great wise province, like trying to illustrate it in the spurn of the male and female, may they roll into the convention. May the Holy Spirit give them life. We realize that the time is perhaps later than we think it is. We pray, God, that as we come here just believing that maybe there is something here that could be done that would help the people or or catch that last sheep. We know when the sheep fold is full, then the shepherd will close the door. As it was like in the days of Noah, when the last member of the family was brought in, God closed the door. And they beat and pounded, but it was too late. Dear God, they had the opportunity. You said, I am that door to the sheepfold. And how striking the song from the poet, Are not ninety and nine enough for thee? But no, there was one more. He might be a little black sheep or he might be a little nobody. Might be the little... Her, he, we don't know where they are, but that last one must come in and then the door will be closed. Oh, God who knows all things, search our lives this morning and send us wherever that we could go that we might find that last one that the door will be closed and the shepherd inside with the sheep Grant it, Lord, if there be that one here today, if that one that's supposed to come in, all the Father has given me will come to me, and no man can come except my Father has drawn him. And if there be a tug or a little feeling that this might be the hour for somebody here in this audience, here or downstairs or wherever they may be, May they answer, Yes, Lord. I am that little wandering one that's wandered away. It's, it's fallen off all my life. I, I, I felt that I should come, but today I'm hanging on the side of the peak. I can't go up or down. I can go no way. Oh, may the great shepherd come, reach down with tender hands and bring that one safely in. Place it up on his shoulders and bring it safely back. Maybe there is one here, Laura, that's sick in a similar condition that the doctor said, there's nothing can be done. He tried hard to rescue it, but he could not rescue it. It's beyond his reach. There's, There's nothing that he can do. His medicine or his knife cannot get to it. But, oh, Lord, there's nothing too far for your great arm. And your word is your arm. So we pray, dear God, that this morning while we are talking to thee, that thou will reach down and pick that one up that's sick and cannot help itself out of the reach of all scientific uh, matters. Away from the doctor, may they be healed. Grant it, Lord. As we think of David as he was 
given a charge over a few sheep, just a few, but one day a bear come in and got that one little sheep and tuck it out and would have eaten it up like a cancer would eat up a body or a huge lion. But David, not too well equipped with a, a rifle or a, not a swordsman, but with only a slingshot, he went after that sheep. And when he found the, the animal that was about to kill the little sheep, he slew it with the slingshot. Just a simple little weapon with a piece of leather and a string. And, but he had confidence in it. We have no great genius among us, Lord. We're simple people with a simple little prayer. But we're coming this morning after Father's sheep. That woman that has walked the streets miserably, smoking cigarette, trying to find peace through the cigarette, that man who has smelt the glass and tried to set it back, but the enemy holds him tight. That boy or girl that's tried to do right and just can't find strength to break away from the wrong thing. We come in the name of the Lord Jesus to claim that sheep this morning. We defy the enemy because it's a simple thing, a slingshot, a prayer, but we're coming to bring that one back to the Father's fold. That we might give an account of those things that's been committed to our hands. May the power of God now strike faith down in the hearts of the people. And may that lost soul return this morning. May the temptations of this life turn him away. Let him go. May he find himself safely upon the master's shoulders being carried back to safety again. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Until I see you tomorrow, I'll turn the service to Brother Shakari. This I, I hope that you, that I found more grace in the sight of God and before you to believe that I'd stand here to tell you something that was wrong. I was past my 56th birthday the other day. <laughs> now, this isn't just an old man's message. I believe this since I was a little boy. And if this isn't true, I've been the most foolish person God had on the earth. I've given my entire life for this cause. And may I say this with sincerity, if I had 10,000 lives, I'd never change my opinion. Now, healing is in reach of every person. Remember, healing is in you. God placed in the peach tree every peach that would ever be in it when he planted it in the garden. See, you just have the peach tree or the apple tree or the fruit tree just has to grow from drinking the water in the earth. Now, each one of you has those potentials in you to deliver you, for it is God since you've been planted into Christ by baptism. Not water baptism, spiritual baptism. You don't come into Christ by water baptism, by spiritual baptism. Tomorrow afternoon, the Lord willing, I'm speaking on that. How and what is the real application of it? We have it in the afternoon, so it won't interfere with any of your services. Now look, each one of you here is standing as believers. See? Then the life that was in Christ is in you. It can, if you can just see it, it's the devil's business to keep you blocked off from that. Keep you blinded. If he can just let you be blinded, that's all. See, you don't know where you're going then. A man that's blind cannot tell where he's going. He's got to seek the understanding from somebody who can see. Until we can understand, somebody's got to tell us what's truth. And Christ died for you and you are transplanted from the world into Christ. 
and everything you have need of is right in you by the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Isn't that right? Now, the only thing you have to do is just start drinking from that. And as the tree drinks, it begins to push out its leaves, its buds, pushes out its fruit each year. The fruit's not in the ground. The fruit is in the plant. How many understand that? Say amen. 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 The fruit is in the plant. And every plant has to drink from his fountain. As the rain comes down, gives that plant life to drink from. And as it drinks, it grows. And it's growing up until it comes to the full bud, just like the church has, to bloom out in this age. And as we drink, we grow. If the plant refuses to drink, then the plant cannot grow. And if you just believe it, now individually, of course, you know how the Lord does, show different things of what you've done and what you should not have done and so forth in the meeting. We was hoping that the Holy Spirit would fall upon us this morning and do such. As we stood, I kept waiting. I think it's the nervous part, thinking downstairs they want us out of here. See, But uh, they're wanting us. We're late now. But believe this with all your heart. Please do. If I, if I found grace in your sight as a truthful person, believe this. I'll put your hands on, on each other. Now look, now the Bible didn't say these signs will follow William Branham. Didn't say to follow Oral Roberts only. Didn't say to follow Brother Kopp or somebody. These signs shall follow them, plural, that believe. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. It's that power of God that's in you that brings to life. To the person you got your hand on, the life-giving source of the Holy Ghost. Dear God, in the name of Jesus Christ, In this crucial moment, when the church, may they stand at this second without nervousness, may the power that raised up Christ from the grave quicken to them just now the truth of the gospel that Jesus' commission was, if they lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. May every demon power, every sickness, every disease, every affliction, every tormenting thing, that's happened to the people may it leave just now by faith as believing people we ask it in Jesus Christ's name Amen now raise your hands and give him praise if you believe that he does it. dear God this baby will die Lord unless this is done I condemn this not in the name of Jesus Christ may it leave the innocent child Amen. Ah, uh, the doctors are trying. They faint. Okay.